everybody. Um, my name is Karen Copeland and uh, welcome to Beating Burnout at Work, Why Teams Hold the Secret to Well-Beating and Resilience with Paula Davis. And her book is coming out March 16th. So you'll have the opportunity then to, uh, then to read it. So you're getting a little pre preview. I haven't seen all of you since December, so I hope everybody's well, but I, I assume everybody is super happy about this programming. So um, I want to talk to you a little bit about Create Exchange. Uh, the X is where all, all the, everything happens. We're all about um, 25 years as an industrial designer, running a, ran a nonprofit, and now I own my own business, one of those founders over 50. So my career has always been at the intersection of art, design, and business. Um, I create learning experience, experiences working with amazing new authors like, um, like Paula. So, um, hey, I realized chronic stress was rampant even before the uh, pandemic and leaders can't ignore it any, any longer. So the past year has really forced all of us to experiment with new solutions, new places and new experiences. Um, come on, it's completely changed how we live, work, learn, shop and play. So we're gonna get into it. We're gonna get into it um, tonight. So um, uh, I'll, I'll go through the agenda in a minute, but first I wanted to introduce you to our community manager, Nicole Carville, and she is the Senior Architecture and Design Workplace Advisor at Hayworth. Uh, say hi, Nicole. Hi, everyone. Um, it is such a pleasure for us at Hayworth to sponsor programming like this. We're um, part of this conversation. I'm here today with our uh, workplace strategist, Beck Johnson. We'll hear from her later. And I'm coming to you, we're talking about beautiful weather, from the uh, Hayworth showroom in, in Philadelphia um, with a beautiful yeah. balcony that's opened up. So <laughs> we are open and we are seeing people and happy to do so. Cocktails after, cocktails Absolutely. after. Absolutely. <laughs> cocktails after. And Neil, um, Neil Batwin, he is um, our IT specialist. He uh, comes from Princeton University where he is a uh, that's where he works and he's been doing this an incredibly long time. So it's really exciting to uh, have Neil working with us on our team. So the mission of these events, it's everything we do in this series is to really reflect how we can be the best leaders and how we can in our, in our business and our communities on how do we navigate the ever changing trends and bolster our well-being in order that we can all have the best positive impact that we can. So before we dive in, uh, for everyone who's participating live, and I think everybody is, I want you to really reflect deeply on what led you to be here today. Um, what about the title of this event? What about Paula made you think, this is really an hour that I want to spend. Uh, so what is your key intention? What are you trying to get out of it? I'd love for you to reflect on that and just type a note in the in the um, to yourself or ideally in the chat window to share with us so that we can uh, make sure to get together with Paula to deliver uh, for you on your key intentions for today. Um, so I wanted just to review the agenda quickly. I'm going to interview um, I'm going to interview Paula and you know present burnout at work. Um, and then what I'm going to do is introduce Beck Johnson and Jennifer Nye into the conversation because we, I, I think we all know this, that, you know, burnout, there's a lot about our environment, our built environment, where we work, where we live. And these two are experts. They're going to help us dive a little bit deeper with Paula. So I'll invite them into the conversation. Then there'll be, then there will be a, um, I, I love this part is anybody that wants to ask a question, please put that in the chat and then we will call on you to ask the question yourself just to unmute and ask that question. I love that part because it enables you to, to ask it in your own voice and participate. Uh, uh, but I also want to be aware that there's a lot of people might not because again we're talking about burnout not not want to be seen or have their um, video on which is which is perfectly perfectly fine. Um, I also wanted to thank my incredible sponsors for supporting this programming. I am, I am live at a Cambridge Innovation Center. It's my co-working space in Philadelphia University City Science Center. And I have this 
fabulous Hayworth furniture behind me. It is, they offer, they're, it, again, collaborators, part of University City. They're unbelievable. They have access to a global network of resources and memberships include a global passport to all the CIC locations around the world. And we're gonna hear from Mina a little later on because she has a, a really cool off, um, offer for everybody. Hayworth um, is, Hayworth is one of the largest furniture manufacturers in the world, and they remain family owned. They improve workplaces through the world by designing unique solutions that promote creativity, focus, and performance. So we're really happy to, again, have them be part of our conversation today. And, and also, um, Nicole, could you, uh, could you talk about Transamerica a second? Yeah, and um, we are we make the product in, at Hayworth, but we really need our dealer uh, service provider to make it all work, and that's Transamerican in Mania. And uh, I have Carla Driver here today with us to, as well. Hi, Carla. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce Paula. Hi, Paula. She is, Paula is the founder and CEO of, of the Stress and Resilience Institute, a training and consulting firm that partners with organizations to help them reduce burnout and build resilience at the team leader and organizational level. So Paula has an amazing story, which of course, that's why she wrote a book. She left the law practice after seven years and earned a master's degree in applied positive psychology from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, as part of her postgraduate training, she was selected to be part of the University of Penn's faculty teaching and training resilience skills with, um, to soldiers as part of the Armory's Comprehensive Soldier and Family Fitness Program. So, and she is the author of Beating Burnout at Work, Why Teams Hold the Secret to Wellbeing and Resilience, which is, of course, um, about prevention using teams-based approach. The book has been published by Wharton Press, so it actually comes out the 16th. And on our follow-up email, we'll give you all the details about, um, about how to buy the book. I've had to read it, which, you know, it torments me that I have to, oh, like lately with, um, I haven't been getting the books beforehand, so I have to write a PDF of it, and I miss, miss, miss um, having the actual book. <laughs> so, um, so also Beating Burnout at Work um, has been nominated for the best spring 2021 book by the Next Big Idea Club, um, which all of these speakers I have had, um, I've had is uh, Adam Grant, of course, Susan Cain, Malcolm Gladwell, and Dan Pink. So, all right, Paula, let's get, let's get into the first question, Paula. All right, I'm ready, um, let's go. Right, let's, <laughs> let's go, about, let's yeah. go. So Paula, what prompted you, God knows, what would prompt you to write a book like this <laughs> between stress and burnout? So, uh, so the, sh the short answer is that uh, so I practiced law for seven years and I burned out during what became the last year of my law practice. So um, really it was about making my mess, my message. <laughs> uh, yes. and, and, and really, I didn't know what burnout was when this happened. This was in 2008, 2009. I had heard the term, but I didn't know there was like a whole thing about it and uh, really was having a hard time just managing my stress and, and got into a whole host of um, just well-being issues over the course of the year that my burnout happened and um, culminating in having panic attacks on a very regular basis. I was in the emergency room twice because I had really bad stomach aches from the stress that I was experiencing. Um, and then kind of realized that this is crazy. Like, I don't, I don't want to sacrifice my health for my career. Like I, I'm all in, in terms of working really hard on, at my job, but I, um, that was sort of the, the tipping point where I realized I really had to do something different. And, and I actually tried to stay in the legal profession. I, I, I went to my boss and I said, Hey, instead of doing all these commercial real estate deals, can I, you know, work on some other, you know, areas of practice and that didn't work. And, um, thought about going back to the firm that I had been part of and that didn't work. And um, so then, you know, I come from an entrepreneurial family. So I thought, all right, I'll tr try my hat out at starting my own business. And here we go. So, so, okay. This is something I struggle with a lot of time is what's the difference between stress and burnout? Yeah. So we, so we all experience stress. So stress exists on a continuum. So does burnout. Um, so there's a whole host of places we can be on that continuum. And 
Um, you know, we just deal with everyday stuff. We usually deal with it fine. We have big stressors in our lives, um, you know, small stressors in our lives. And how we know we're kind of leaving the stress space and going into burnout is with a constellation, there's kind of three big symptoms or dimensions of burnout that people need to pay attention to. Um, and so the first one is a chronic physical and emotional exhaustion. Yeah. So, it, and I remember this, it was like nothing that I did just replenished my tank, right? It was, I used to play, you know, co-ed softball with my fan or with my friends and I stopped doing that. And I eventually just wanted some bad reality television in the couch and like, leave me alone. Cause there was nothing that I did that made me feel like, yes, it's Monday morning and I'm ready to go. Um, so that was, um, so that was the first, that's one big dimension. Um, the second big dimension or symptom to pay attention to is chronic cynicism. So it's, that's the case where people just start to bug you and annoy you again, more often than not, because we all have bad days and we all have tired weeks and we all have people who kind of bug us, but this is more often than not consistently, this is happening. And what that does is if you notice, like maybe it's your colleagues, maybe it's your kids, maybe it's other family members, maybe it's your clients or your patients or what have you, you just start to disconnect a little bit from them. It's just, you know, you're annoying me. And so I'm kind of going to do this. And so like, I remember thinking with a lot of my real estate clients, you know, they would call me up and, and outwardly, I was always very professional, but inwardly, a lot of eye rolling going on. Like, ugh, do we have to have this conversation? Can you figure this out on your own? Um, I practice commercial real estate law. So I would often think, you know, does the world need another mini mall? <laughs> Helping developers build mini malls was my job. And so I kind of had to get on board with it. So there's that cynicism piece. And then that leads to um, what the research calls inefficacy or what I think of as lost impact. So it's the why bother, who cares? Like why bother, who cares? You're not gonna listen to my advice anyway. So why are we having this conversation? Am I really having the impact that I wanna have in the profession? Am I seeing any meaning in my work? And so when you start to feel that collection of traits, that is more in the burnout space than just, I'm just dealing with stress and it's, it's a stress related issue. Wow. So, okay. So how has COVID, how has COVID forced the conversation about burning full and meaningful change within organizations? Because we all know it was here beforehand. So and I feel it. Yeah, I feel, and I feel like that's something to punctuate because there was a big burnout problem happening before COVID and I don't want people and leaders to think like, well, when COVID you know, finally resolves itself, we're not gonna have a burnout problem anymore. It's, it's just gonna go away. And that's not, that's not the case because it, it's a significant, it was very much a significant issue. And I go through some of the statistics in different industries um, about that before, before the pandemic. But I think what has escalated with the pandemic is people are, um, leaders, especially in organizations are starting to, I think, go, oh, like their eyes are opened a little bit because we're literally every single one of us living in the same stress producing event. So as a leader, I can't just say, oh, it's just something that you're dealing with in your life or, oh, it's, it's this other group and it's an issue that they're dealing with. We're all in it right now. And I think that for the first time, um, what's being exposed is, first of all, all of the challenges that we had before the pandemic started. You add all of this stuff to it and psychologically, we're just it's just a hard environment to be in such that now you're seeing and leaders are seeing up close and personal kind of the fallout and the swirl of all of that. And so I think it is at least, I'm hopeful, I'm starting to see more conversations around Let's really talk about this, but talk about it in the right way so that we can really meaningfully do something about burnout instead of just applying some Band-Aid strategies to it. I, and I love that part you talk about the individual first, the team, that it's not the individual problem all the time. It's really more team because I guess we can all say about, um, I know a lot of people are saying this is just the way I've always dealt with a lot of my stress and anxiety is running the physical part yep. of it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so so this was a big aha moment that I've I've had kind of a gradual but big aha moment over the past 10 years I've been doing this work because when I burned out, I very much thought of it as my problem, right? Like I must have done something wrong. I didn't manage my stress right. This was my fault. You know, how am I how am I gonna fix it? Um, and instead, you know, what the research is very clear about, and then also just, you know, what people were shouting at me when I would coach them or when I would interview them about their burnout experiences is that 
look, I'm, I'm in a system that isn't helping me here, right? So it's, 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 yes, there are some things that you're bringing to the table in terms of your own resilience levels or stress management, you know, capabilities or self-care practices. But the bigger issue is that this is a systemic problem with systemic right causes that we haven't been talking about that need to be addressed and and it's misplaced for us to be thinking about this as an individual issue that's an individual issue that's right yeah. so um i i want to include i want to include um a jennifer and uh back and bring them into the conversation right now because i think again there's so much about the environment the, the connection between the environment especially in the in the workplace and at home that but I know a lot of their um, information will, will greatly enhance our, our talk. So I first I wanted to introduce Beck Johnson and she is the senior research specialist. Uh, she manages uh, Hayworth Human Performance Lab with nearly 20 years of experience in social science research. And uh, she conducts like, oh God, the, all the research at the intersection of human and organizational performance in the, in the workplace. So um, a lot of the, the work that Beck has been working on, I think it's gonna contribute a lot. Um, then I want to introduce, um, cause it's Beck, it's, it's on-site and remote work with resources for resilience, right? Say that again. The, it, it's, and the name of the report is on-site and remote work resources for resilience. Yep, that's right. yep, that's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and then Jennifer Nye is a principal, principal at L2P, a Philadelphia-based firm focusing on architecture, tier design, and planning. And she is a director of workplace, of workplace planning and strategy, developing new ways of working and transforming where people work and learn. So these two are very busy all together. So, so um, let's let, let me just uh, hop in with a question for for them. So back for you know what back first talk a little bit about your research that you've been working on. So I think that's a good basis for us to talk about. Sure, that's kind of a dangerous thing to say because I could go on for a long time, but I'll All give right, you the I, like a quick and dirty off. version. Cut you off. Yeah, Just remember that. <laughs> quick and dirty version. Um, so we started this research program, this agenda that we were working on before the pandemic, and we were interested in the role that the physical built environment has in preventing burnout. Um, so what are some of the things that can be available as resources for um, employees and people in the workplace that they'll use to not only help them perform their job well, but to help them manage any stressors that, that occur in the workplace, right? So we were, we're looking at what are some of those things? And then the pandemic hit and it was, okay, now we really have, you know, this like fantastic natural experiment, if I can get excited about it, um, in terms of people are like the whole population is really struggling and trying to manage this and what's happening. Um, and so we ended up just, just conducting a survey, a U.S.-based survey, asking folks about whether they think of certain things as either threats to their ability to complete their work or gains for their ability to complete their work. Um, and we had some interesting findings. Um, there were, you know, the cohort of folks that had gone off-site um, entirely remotely because of COVID and hadn't been back into the workplace in months. There were folks that never left, you know, their workplace. They had to be there, um, were on-site. And then we had a mix of folks that were in between. Um, and, and the resources that kind of come to the top of the list depends on where you're at. Right. And, and right. I, it, it's connected to what exactly are you trying to achieve in those locations. So, yeah. And Paula, I want you to, act, um, after Beck speaks or anything, just interject if you want to interject in that um, before I have Jennifer talk. Yeah, no, I mean, there's there's a lot to sort of, you know, kind of capitalize on or think about what you're talking about. I talk a lot in the book about resources and how we have to be thinking about resources. And um, it's an important part of the burnout equation because burnout happens mm -hmm. when you have too many demands and too few resources. So when, we, when we think about our resources, oftentimes we think about like, um, you know, finances and personnel and equipment and those tangible kind of resources, but we're not thinking about it in terms of the space that we're in or right. our strengths or some of these other intangible resources that we might have. And so to be paying attention to those things and how they mm -hmm. are 
informing how we're dealing with our environment, I think becomes really important. And it's an interesting angle that I think is mm -hmm. great. So, so Jennifer, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about what you're, you know, what you're seeing, because I know you're out there, you're out there very busy redesigning these spaces, getting ready for people to come back. And what are you seeing? It's pretty incredible. Right. Uh, I think that, you, you know, when you talk about what is the purpose of place, that is really um, what it comes down to. And, and when you think about high performing teams and what they, their needs are, we spend a lot of time with our clients trying to understand exactly what are you doing and how do you solve place to support those tasks and activities. So more, more now than ever, we're trying to bring people back to the workplace. And, and so we understand that we may have a hybrid workforce, we may have uh, some remote workers, some full time. What what does place do to serve all of the population that you have in your organization, and how can we best um, serve you in your modes of work? So, where are you going to do your heads down work? Where are you spending that focus time? What are the peripheries you need? What does that space need to do mm -hmm. acoustically? Um, comfort. You know, there's a lot of um, uh, points to address there. Um, but how are you going to collaborate? How do you? What kind of technology do you need? You know, it, you know, we talk about all these Zoom calls. It's going to be nice to sit in a room with a few people, maybe socially distanced, but <laughs> be there and, and to, to relax a little bit. Um, and, and then we also talk about where are we going to, you know, so the socialization aspect of it. We know that everyone being cooped up at home all day long, you want to go to work to be able to see people. There's a reason. Where are you going to do that? How are you going to do it? And what kind of spaces are you going to do it in? Right. And like, you know what I love this one, uh, Paula, for you to and then and then the team is why is psychological safety at work such a critical critical piece of preventing burnout? I was just literally I was literally gonna go there when John I know, I was like that. I'm like ready, I'm like ready to jump in with my psychological safety <laughs> bit because um, you know, she was, she was talking about what high performing teams look like. And you know, this was one of the things that I keyed on keyed in on pretty quickly when I was going through all of the research studies, trying to come up with my model of high performing and resilient teams. And one of the things that really jumps out at you when you look at that is this whole notion of psychological safety. And essentially what that is, is trust. It's trust at the team level. And how it's it's hard enough to build when you are all in the same environment and in the same space um, and it becomes much more difficult when you are talking about trying to maintain levels of trust in a virtual environment and now as i think about going forward a hybrid type environment where you've got some people who will be in a physical workspace and you have some people who are going to be you know remote or still virtual um, it compounds an already difficult um, yeah. you know thing but mm -hmm. it, it's such a critical component, like it, it's I included as a foundational element of high performing and resilient teams in my book, because it's just a lot of the other stuff is going to be hard to um, really make the way that you want it in your environment or your culture until you have that that set notion of, hey, I can show up as myself, I can, you know, raise my hand, I can say something yeah. innovative, I can push back, I can respectfully disagree without fear of being put down or singled out or embarrassed or somehow penalized or whispered after whispered about after the meeting and and that's right. what psychological mm -hmm. safety is. Yeah. So um Beck or or Jennifer, you want to talk at all about that? A little bit about that? Uh sure. I think um one of the things that that um is we included in our study too is this notion of social capital, right? And so we kind of put that in there in terms of psycho psychological safety and trust amongst your colleagues is really important. Um, where are you going to do that when you're on site, right? So are there specific locations that can help facilitate those kinds of trusted um, and trusting conversations? And do you have permission from the organizational culture to spend time in those places, in those kinds of activities? Um, basically, if, where, where I come from, it's kind of, it's social grease, right? I mean, psychological safety is that, that grease that helps folks allow, allows them to coordinate all of their knowledge and their efforts. And, and where, where does that happen? And what does that look like? Um, and I think that's a question for Jennifer, you know? <laughs> go ahead, Jennifer. Okay, Jennifer, go ahead. You know, it's, uh, as we start to, um, re-engage with the clients to talk about uh, ways to re-entry, uh, re-enter the workplace and we, and we think about change management. 
um, leaders are talking about where to do those activities and making sure that they are yeah. uh, providing the opportunity for their people to be able to sit in an open area or go to a, a small enclave two person room. Those, those other places, other than your physical work seat or a private office, there's other opportunities within the work environment to do that. Leaders have to be the, be the change and they have to start going to those places and show the rest of the workforce that it's okay to have conversations, build those tr trust, trust networks and utilize the entire uh, workplace facility to, to be able to inspire and collaborate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one, one thing I wanted to add too with, um, you know, the notion of psychological safety is, you know, I talk in the book about very specific behaviors that leaders and then everyone on the team can really do to promote it or to erode it. What really struck me was um, how it's really built in little five to 10 minute micro interactions, mm -hmm. like each day throughout the week over the course of a handful of weeks, and then they build on each other. And so, you know, I think to, to Jennifer and Beck's point, really being intentional about how you're going to create those moments or when you have those moments, it's like, here's your five minute opportunity to cement trust or to erode it. And we oftentimes don't think like that when we are going through our our day-to-day -day interactions okay so how can the how can leaders determine if the teams are thriving so what measures can they take to um to pivot if needed like what okay so that's what are the measurements i guess so I guess for me, I think first of all is thriving is a research based term and we use the term very loosely and, and apply it in a lot of different contexts, but it's vitality plus learning and growth. So it's paying attention to, um, you know, the energy levels within the team. Are you tracking or picking up on or talking about um, people feeling overloaded? Are people saying that they're feeling overloaded, de-energized? Um, there's a whole body of science talking about like energizers in the work and you know, being able to map those people out within your team, the people who you just gravitate to because they have lots of energy, yeah. um, but it's also the learning and growth component. And so, um, you know, that's an important job resource that I talk about in the book too, um, you know, as a core need that we have is competence, right? We mm -hmm. need to feel like we're continuing to learn and grow and develop as professionals. And do you have those tools available to you? Do you have those resources? Are there professional development opportunities that you have within your team or within your organization to feel like you're continuing to develop as a professional. And so that's my starting point for thriving. Yeah. To build on that, I think, um, yes, absolutely. I, I agree with everything that Paul has said. And um, to kind of where, where we come back down to repeatedly is when do we find time to do that, right? Um, how do, because it's it's those little moments, but they those will you know leak into meeting times and those kinds of things. And you know, learning requires oftentimes some deep work. Um, and and a and a complaint that I hear about from clients and, and colleagues it, um, is you know I'm I'm so overscheduled. Like I, I I'm I'm going from Jen. Didn't you Jennifer? You I think you mentioned this when we were on an earlier call. It's meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting and meeting and. This was pre-pandemic. I mean, I had colleagues that were doing that all day long, every day in office. And, and I remember having conversation with one of our directors at the time and, and he was complaining. And I said, do you schedule out time for you to do your own deep work? And he looked at me like, what? And I was like, um, how do you expect to continue to grow and, and you know, move yourself forward if you don't take that time and prioritize it? And I think that's kind of a, a bit of a message for leaders is that I know we might have learning goals, but you also need to recognize that it's appropriate to take enough time throughout the work week to be doing that. You shouldn't be learning off the clock, right? I mean, um, I, I sit in a position where I do research and, and my job is essentially to learn. And so I have a big chunk of time that I set aside each day to, to call the newest research, right? And, and to read books like Paula's so that I can make connections. Um, but I think everybody deserves to have a little bit of that time for their own personal growth because at the end of the day, the organization is what wins, right? They, they get the benefit of that. Well, and, and back to, to, you know, to capitalize on what you're saying and to, and to kind of build that out, uh, you know, there are a core handful of job demands that the research points to that really are the core causes of what's driving burnout in organizations. And top of the list is workload. 
it's um, high work, having high workload and high work workload pressure, high work pressure. And so I don't know that there, for me, I don't think I've talked to a team yet thus far who doesn't talk about that or share that as one of their main issues. And it's, it's, I think everyone goes, well, yeah, of course we have high workload, but the, the challenge is then how do we tackle dealing with that in the meeting space? Right is one aspect of that. And I think it's one entry point where um, leaders or people who have any sort of influence can start to like really more consciously think about, is this the meeting that we need to have? Yes or no. If the answer is yes, okay, does it have to be on Zoom? Do we all have to have our cameras on? Because we're exhausted by the end of the day trying to track, do my earrings look right? Does my hair look okay? Like, do I look goofy on camera? Because I've never had to think about that before. I'm exhausted. Um, by the end of the day, having to try to think about that, can we can we do this by conference call? Um, you know, yeah. can we keep it to how do we keep it to twenty minutes or thirty minutes? And I think there has to be a lot more intentionality around that aspect of workload. At least it's something within our mm-hmm. control, kind of you know, versus having the conversation around you know we have no budget to bring in three additional people who can help with this. So um, right. that workload issue is a very very big problem when it comes to burnout. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, just I, I have a, a question because I'm a creative person and it torments me to not be in the same room with someone to like do. <laughs> and I, I, so I wanted to ask Jennifer this question about, um, you know, creativity. It, 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 it is putting that creativity and scheduling and what tools are employees using to determine how to utilize um, you know, what the future of, 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 of work, the future of what the office will look like, because this is not going to go away, all the incredible new technology that we have. Um, but it, it's, uh, so I, that's the kind of question about that for you, Jennifer. It is, it is definitely a challenge. I, we're, you know, as a designer, we've been forced uh, very quickly to try to adapt and pivot, try to figure out a new way to, to solve for it. Each project is different. Each client is different. Um, so it, you know, we've had our own internal challenges, uh, quite honestly, to try to figure out how do we, how do we design, how can we be creative, yeah. what are the technology tools, and so we've been, um, you know, as an internal teams looking at different um, whiteboarding tools and screen shares and mm-hmm. project pages and teams. Yeah, pages. yeah. But it, it, it still hasn't changed that we still meet each other in the office to have that tactile quality of materials and finish and. and just to make the conversation flow much faster. Even if we're standing in the room six feet apart, it, it, we've had so much uh, more engagement in just having those um, really finite conversations and, and being very focused mm-hmm. about the time that you're spending. And I think that you know, when we talk about uh, you know, your meeting schedules and, and, and thinking about your over scheduling, now more than ever, we're, we're seeing that we're spending the time and to say, okay, we've got 25 minutes. Let's really think about this. Let's charrette through these ideas and, and be as creative as possible. Spitball as many ideas as you can, because we know that we're only seeing each other for that amount of time. And I think that we're being, mm-hmm. we're, we're being more productive in that time because we're, we're being thoughtful about our time. Right. Uh, right. So that has been a huge shift in the way that we're designing. Um, and I think that it, it, it's, it's evolving and still evolving. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, look, as technology keeps changing and learning, I mean, look, there, I mean, that's another huge added stress for all of us. It's like, you're trying to just keep up with the latest, like, like everything, the latest everything. And what is the best tool? Like, what, what do you choose? You know, there's so many options out there. They, it's kind of, you're bombarded with it in a way. And so you're having to learn all these different platforms that all these different people have, which adds compounds on just our normal, regular mm-hmm. workload and, and, and life part of it. Um, I have to say before we get into questions, there was a, I was talking to this ritual designer yesterday and I just loved that he, what he was doing because he said that what he'll do is um, if he's working with clients or businesses, they'll go on a walk together, but they're all over the country. And so he's taking them basically on a walk. He's like, go out the door and they're walking all over their neighborhoods. He'll say, take a left. I thought that was like really awesome. He's like, now take it. Now That's look cool. at that tree or look at, because we all think about we've done things like that with people in our groups or whatever, but the fact that he's doing it virtually with people all over the country, I thought that was really great. I'll have a group of like 20 people, but I thought that was a, a, mm-hmm. such a great That's idea. Awesome. 
Yeah, great idea. So I wanted, Nicole, you and I, I want to, there's so many amazing questions and um, I wanted to give people the opportunity to ask Paula um, questions and or, or Jen or uh, Jennifer or, or Beck. So um, if you can help me, Nicole, I know there's so many and I'm just looking at them myself uh, kind of for the first time. Again, we're gonna call on you to, to ask it. If you it's, want. it's funny, I'm seeing a little thread just starting, Karen, um, and, and uh, the group. People are missing their commutes. Who would have thought that would happen? But, you know, when we realize we, we don't have any downtime anymore. So there's a couple of people that are commenting on that. And yeah, and I, oh, I'm sorry, Nicole. Go ahead, go ahead, Paula. Yeah, no, I was just going to say um, it's a very consistent theme that I hear. And um, it, I think it goes back to this whole conversation around boundaries because um, I, I almost, it's hard for me to have conversations with people without having some sort of conversation come in about boundaries. I don't have them. How do I set them? What's going on with them? What do I do? Um, kind of a piece. And so, um, you know, the commute, though, I think it was also, our reflection time a little bit. We could kind of zone out a little bit. We could listen to the radio. We got our earbuds in. Um, it's one of the things that I miss about traveling because um, when I would finish, you know, with my teaching during the day, I'd often have evening flights home. I have my window seat and I would just look out the window and it was just my thinking about my business, thinking just generally about life or, you know, stuff. And I, that's been engineered out and we're, I think we miss it and it's hard to engineer it back, back in. And so it makes a ton of sense to me about why it's missed. I think it's very interesting. And, in, in, you know, if you um, rewind a year ago, everyone was saying, oh, this is great. You know, I roll out of bed, I'm wearing my sweats. I'm, uh, mm -hmm. you know, at the computer, my time is so flexible. Well, now your workday is extended. I'm not commuting anymore. I don't have my decompression time. Now I'm thinking, well, maybe I should schedule my decompression time back in. And that's my commute again, because yeah. to Beck's point, that is when I used to ride the train an hour each day. I used to read emails or read something that I wanted to read, do some research, um, you know, just anything to prepare myself for the switch to home life. And um, I think that that has put such a stress on, on, you know, me personally, but I'm hearing it from my mm -hmm. team as well. And, and so I think that at least now, Maybe I need to end the day and go for the walk around the block and then come back in. You know, one of the strategies well, that I talk about with folks is um, it's a variation on what Dan Pink writes about in his book, When, and it's, um, I call it your, your three, two, one way to end your day. So it's taking three minutes to think about what you accomplished during the day. So we know the science around tracking small wins and tracking small successes is super motivational. It's one of the most motivational things we can do, right? So I feel like, woohoo, I'm checking the checking my to-do list off. I can do this and now I can tackle the, you know, the next day. So a few minutes to, to write about what you accomplished during the day or the week, if you do this weekly. Um, a couple of minutes to think about, okay, how do I intentionally want to go into my day tomorrow? How do I intentionally want to go into my work week next week? Um, obviously, mm -hmm. you've got fires and things that will come up, but giving some intentional thought to that is important. And then spending a minute or so thinking about someone to thank. So who is somebody who's helped you during um, the week or during the day? Um, because recognition is a lack of recognition is another huge job demand that can drive burnout. And so um, I have yet to meet the person who has said to me, Paula, I'm being thanked too much at work and I wish people would stop. Um, and so, so putting, putting that little, the, the, the little three, two, one kind of thing into place at the end of your day is also a nice little boundary. It's a nice little stopping point. Even if you got to do more work, you know, in, into the evening, it's just a nice kind of end or a punctuation note. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, um, all right. So let's look at any, you know, what did we cover? I just wanted to make sure we covered this. And I know Paul, you and I talked about a little bit. It's why can't you yoga or retreat your way out of a burnout? <laughs> I kind of love how that quote. And I know we talked a little bit of putting the onus on the individual and said the company, but I, and I know that was a Forbes article as well. So yes. I see, let's, let's like dive a little bit of that because I see that might be some of the conversations too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I published that. It was either a week or two ago and it was um, my article on Forbes on my Forbes blog was why you can't yoga your way out of burnout. 
And it's because, um, again, we've been taking so much of an individual lens or focus on burnout, thinking of it as a syndrome of exhaustion only, and therefore applying stress management and self-care techniques to deal with exhaustion. So we tell people exercise more or um, you know, other, other things that aren't bad. They're very, very good. They're just not the right strategies to actually help us deal with burnout. And so until we look at the causes, the actual causes of burnout, which are these core demands, like too much work, um, not enough recognition, lack of autonomy, so I don't have a say over what I can say yes or no to, or any decision-making authority. Um, I'm in an unfair environment, so unfairness is what you know the research would say. Like So there's favoritism in my world, or there's organizational politics and red tape such that I just need a simple answer to a question, and I got to wait three weeks and go through five layers of stuff in order to get a simple response to something. Um, and then um, values disconnect. So I have things that are important to me about work that I want to get out of my work and I'm not getting that from, from my environment. And so there's a disconnect there. Um, also lack of colleague and leader support. And so I think that's been exposed a little bit now too in a virtual world. We're not as clear that people have our back. We're not as clear right. about feeling that sense of support. So when you dig into those things, those are the root causes. Those are the big causes of burnout. Self-care strategies are great and they help you deal with some of the offshoot stress that comes from that, but they're not gonna fix those core issues. Right. So that was the point of my article. Right, right. right. So hold a second. There was a, this, I know this is a common, there, so, oh, oh, the woman that wrote me in because she felt she couldn't ask the question. So. And I, I do think women are feeling, I know I have felt this way a lot of times years back. Uh, how do you relay that you're feeling burnt out at work without looking lazy or high maintenance, you know, because we haven't really been supported in a lot of way. And that comes down to a lot of the trust is, you know, the check off the list and especially for women. I mean, especially for women with kids at home and the you know, the school mm -hmm. and all that stuff and not wanting to feel like they're complaining or whining. And, and so that was one of the questions. Yeah. And I, I, I have in my book, I have a, cause this, this comes up very frequently for me, um, both with women and with men. I have a couple of, of um, guy friends, one who's a, um, he's a fantastic lawyer, but he's, he's a single dad. And so he's also facing, you know, some of these, yeah. some of these same issues. And so, uh, you know, I was thinking of that when I was um, writing the book and so many people asked me like, how do I just talk about this stuff? How do I, even if I'm feeling okay, but I'm worried about somebody else on my team or I'm not okay and I need to tell somebody, how do I, how do I even start that conversation? And so in the book, I've got um, a nice little template for people to think about both before you have the conversation and then also when you go to have the conversation yeah. just some just some things that to consider as talking points so that you feel a little bit more clear when you have the conversation because when we get to a point where we're feeling stressed or we're worried about somebody else it can turn into this sort of like blah kind of thing and and now my leader isn't clear about okay so what are you asking for what do you really need what is what is the thing that you want to have happen how can i help you and we don't give enough intentionality to that before we go into the conversation and so i've sort of given folks a little bit of a roadmap for that so mm -hmm. i wanted to call on uh, jennifer mishkin she has a question jennifer you want to unmute yourself and ask that question she's still here i am still here yep oh, that's been the right button Hey, um, yeah, so my question was, I'm, I'm pretty good about trying to put things that I need to do or research time onto my calendar, but then my team has some issue that comes up and I have to address, like you're leading a group, you you need to, to make sure that they're okay. And so they'll say, do you have time this afternoon? And I'll say, yes, of course I do. And then that research time or that project that I'm supposed to be working on gets bumped to the next day or bumped to the next day. And so I'm just wondering if anybody has any good advice around that, because how, how do you how do you balance that between your own needs for not getting burnt out and not putting your team in a really stressful situation by saying, no, I can't talk to you right now. I need to do this research. And that's empathy. It's the whole empathy. So you're, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the thing you struggle. go ahead, Paula. 
Oh, well, so one of the, so this, this is another thing that comes up in a lot of my um, post-workshop coaching conversations. And this is something that I think is actually, um, there's so much about the burnout conversation that might feel like outside of our control. But one of the entry points that I start at with people is, um, and I've got a whole section on it in the book, is talking about um, identifying your icebergs. The, the research term is icebergs. I call them your rules. So they're your core values and beliefs about the way you think the world should operate. So we don't walk into work every day thinking these things, but they influence so much of how we lead and whether we prioritize self-care and things like that. And so Jennifer, one of your one of your core values and beliefs or one of your themes or rules might be something around good leaders are always there for their teams. That might just be something that you think is an important you know, aspect of leadership and that you've internalized throughout your, your career. And that's fantastic. It's a great belief. It's gotten you, you know, to a really great place where you're at, but it's also acting as a way, uh, as, as, as sort of a rug, because when you need to have your concentrated time um, to, to work on your research or read or do whatever it is that you need to do, that theme keeps bumping up against your, what, what you're trying to do is important for you. And it pulls you back into then still continuing to have conversations with your team. And so that's just one entry point that I think about, but it's important for all of us to identify those core values and beliefs and themes because they're oftentimes way too inflexible for us to operate in the way that we need to or want to in terms of prioritizing our self-care or leading um, really effectively. So, I mean, like one of my own core values that I will always struggle with is that taking a break is a sign of laziness. Um, my family just has a mantra and a work ethic around, or, you know, beliefs around work ethic. And so I can tell you any number of circumstances in my, you know, growing up and in college and things where um, that was just, you know, very much reminded for me. And so even mm -hmm. today, it's like, I'm thinking, you know, gosh, if I have some spare time, I could like take a 20 minute nap, but then my brain is like, but no, you've got to write an article and you've got all these other things to do. And, you know, how dare you take 20 minutes for yourself? And so um, we have to continue to surface these and wrestle with them. Um, but that's kind of a, a deeper layer piece that I think is important for us to, to be thinking. Can about. I say, um, I am a recovering overachiever um, I struggle with the exact same thing, uh, this tremendous amount of guilt that I put on myself that I, you know, I really, I hear you, I have to wrestle with it every day. And um, to, is it, was it Jennifer that had asked the question? Yeah. One of the tricks that I learned was when somebody comes to me with something and it, and it seems urgent, the first thing I ask is, when do you need that by? <laughs> you know, and, and, and honestly, most of the time, it's not within the same day for me anyways, and it might be different for you, but sometimes just that prompt gets them to think about the urgency of their request. Is this something that they could maybe touch base with you on tomorrow morning or do you know what I mean? So it, it allows you to then have that conversation about the expectation of, of, of that, how that time is spent. That's so good. Because you know what? I'm one of those instant gratification people. If I have a question, I want you to answer me in five minutes, mm -hmm. or two minutes. And that's so horrible. And I'm learning to get rid of those evil ways. <laughs> I'm really learning to get rid of those evil ways that I do I do that. But it's how we're conditioned. So Karen, I'll be like, it do is, you really like, need you it right away? Yeah. You're conditioned <laughs> to say, oh my gosh. And so I'm, I'm learning now, you know, when self-employed and you don't have all these like people working for you, <laughs> they're maybe not going to get back to you for a day. So it's, yeah. it's, it's good, but you realize I didn't really need that information in five minutes. I'm okay. I'm going to live without yeah. that information. <laughs> but yeah. I, it's a tension, right? It's a yeah. tension that you have to manage. Um, and, and, you know, some days are better than others. Yes. All right. So let's keep looking. Um, let's keep looking uh, for other other questions. Nicole, do you see well, anything or yes. anything that we're missing before it's, 451. I, I, we have about um, like seven minutes. Uh, uh, I think the thread, Karen, that really resonated um, with me is that we initially started, the questions are, were always about 
us, me, what can I do? How can I change? And as you see it, you know, throughout the presentation, it's very clear that we need to shift that responsibility over to the organization as, you know, Paula and Jen and Beck have been saying, and we need to focus on those resources. Um, I'd let, mm -hmm. I think, I think we could answer a lot of these questions by talking more about what some of these resources are that will help prevent the burnout. And the other thing that I, I think we need to uh, talk about is that squish in the middle where, you know, the managers are getting that, you know, leadership is right. dealing with burnout, you know, we're lead, and, you know, where that evil squish is happening. That land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. That's actually something that we found um, in, in our study was um, looking at folks that were kind of at risk for burnout. Um, managers rated higher than the other types of roles in an organization. And I think it's because of that. It's, it's that, you know, they want to do right by their teams, but then leadership might not quite get it, you know, so they are, they're stuck in that middle um, and as somebody who's, um, I have a manager above me, I keep thinking to myself occasionally, what can I do? What can I do to ease her job? Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what can I do to help her do her job easier and better? Um, because I don't want to give up the, the chit chat that we get to have, you know, once in a while we do our little coffee chats. Um, but if she's so overloaded with other kinds of tasks, what can I do to help her? Um, when I, when I have the resources to do that um so yeah and i tend to i tend to, t to talk about it as well as um it's a so the research component is from um, folks at harvard business school but they they call it the producer manager dilemma or the the you know leader ah. you know, <laughs> dilemma and that it's like i i have leadership responsibilities but i'm also still called on to produce work yeah. how do you manage that tension because at some point there's going to be a, a give like a give and a take and i'm going to have to prioritize likely getting the work done over some of my leadership responsibilities but i don't want to do that because then i feel horrible um and mm -hmm. so i always ask people when i do this um, when we talk about this in coaching conversations is what is the highest and best use of your time mm -hmm. and so that might I also visualize it in terms of buckets. So sometimes it's helpful for people to think of like, what are your most pressing or important two or three buckets that you have? And that's the highest and best use of your time. And that's where you should be spending most, most of your time. And so like, you know, to Jennifer's point, if you have somebody on your team come to you with a question, um, the response might be to help them kind of start to think about how they can craft a solution to it rather than having to always put the burden on your shoulders to have the answer because that can be exhausting. It takes time, it takes energy. Um, and so a couple, both of those things, what's the highest and best use of your time? And then thinking in terms of like how to coach them to, to get them to come up with an answer themselves versus always having to be the answer person can help. Okay. Um, any other question? Probably one more question. Anybody. Well, you know what we didn't we didn't really touch on the resources piece either and I think the reason no, we didn't touch on the resources okay come on uh, Paula that's a good one right so that's so that's important so so we have to um, and, and I've got a whole graph in the book where we have to start thinking about the resources that we know are going to start to slow down burnout and so that is like a team and colleagues support it's some of the opposite things that I had talked about with the demands right it's it's being able to give people the perception of autonomy in their environment it's being transparent and clear so that could be simply adding one more sentence to an email or two more sentences to an email so somebody now whoever you're maybe giving a project to is is understands here's what I'm supposed to do and I'm not confused about when I'm supposed to do it or like who I'm supposed to report to. And, um, you know, so, there, so there's lots of those types of resources that we have to think about, but then also thinking about, are there anything, are, are there procedures or policies or things that you're dealing with constantly that come up over and over again, that can be codified, that can be turned into templates right. so that you, you know, you know, you're not reinventing the wheel every time somebody asks you for something right. because have a, you know, something that you can send. So that's an, another different type of an example of a resource. Our, um, our study looked, yeah, go ahead. Um, so our study kind of did a, did a light touch on what Paula's talking about. And then we looked, we looked at what, 
what's available in the built environment. Um, and one of the things that, especially in terms of building resilience, um, one of the things that came up in the top three, didn't matter where you were, whether you were offsite or you were on site somewhere, was this notion of ambient qualities, which encompasses access to clean air, you know, access to daylight, access to nature and natural elements, management of noise, and thermal comfort. That's in the top three in terms of building resilience, right? So if that's something that an organization can do in terms of the physical spaces that they provide for their employees, those are going to hit well and resonate well with folks, especially when they're dealing with some chronic stress, right? So those sorts of things become more important to people when, when they are experiencing stress. Like, absolutely. I remember um, just walking at, at, at Hayworth, we have this beautiful three-story um, atrium. You know, it's, it's all glass, it's north facing. And my lab was back in a little corner somewhere for a while. And I remember I would just need a break and I would walk out to the front to the atrium and just the, the sunlight hitting my face and my eyes, you know, that sensation that you get in your head when that happens and it just was refreshing. Right. So it's, it, and we go, gosh, that's so simple, but really it, it can have a profound effect when you start to add those, those layers of things in the physical workplace that help to kind of create restorative opportunities, right. Um, chances to recharge, um, you know, Jen was talking about how, you know, creativity is, is a huge thing if for a lot of people in the workplace. And, you know, we've done some previous uh, lit review in, into what that looks like. And one of the things that we understand about how the neuroscience about how that happens is your brain literally needs to chill out for things to kind of percolate yeah. and for that idea to come. This is why we like our commute, our commute so much, right? If you were, you just let things kind of float around in your noggin. Like I did some of my best thinking in my graduate studies because I had an hour and 20 commute. Um, so it's, it's those kinds of things. And then, you know, having conversations with, with leaders going, if somebody's staring off into space, please don't disrupt them because their brain's doing something really good. Don't tell them to get back to work because now you're stressing them out and then okay. the brain shuts off. Right. <laughs> Go ahead, Nicole. Jen. Uh, you know what, one yeah. of the things I love, I love, uh, you know, the pandemic is like, you live in these neighborhoods and, you know, you didn't see a lot of your neighbors that much, but now it's so wonderful because any time of the day you're out walking, you're just, I always say I'm taking myself for a walk. I'm like going out and I'm like not bringing the yep. dogs. I'm like taking myself for a walk, but it's like, but you see so many people and they're on the phones, whatever. It's just, it's so beautiful to see that, that everybody's realizing, hey, we got to get out. We got to walk. We got to even you know, bundled up and it's really cold, but it's such yeah. a positive thing. And, and hopefully now people will realize that the importance of, of, of self-care and advocating for themselves, advocating for themselves, which is, which is, a, huge, you know, mm -hmm. which is a huge part of it. Um, so I, I, um, I wanted to thank everybody so much for, for being a part of this. Uh, we, um, there's, there's a VIP portion and those people just stay on because you'll be moved into another room. I, I wanted, um, before we closed out, I wanted to, um, Mina, are you there? Yeah, hi, I'm here. Hi, Mina. So I, Mina uh, works with me. She runs the events at the Cambridge Innovation Center, CIC, and she, she wanted to uh, give people that, that, well, I guess it depends what city, but in Philadelphia, a little offer. So go ahead, Mina. Yeah, um, I have a special offer from CIC Philadelphia for all of our local attendees, and I'm going to drop that in the chat. Um, but just wanted to say thank you, Karen, and everyone um, for this great conversation, and I really appreciate it. Um, everything that was touched upon today, especially loved, um, you know, when you touch upon those little moments of interaction. And I saw someone in the chat, you know, talking about the serendipity of those water cooler conversations and just having that physical environment, um, which is why I'm so pleased that we are able to offer um, all of our attendees who are interested a free month of co working if they sign up for a membership in 2021. Come um, see me, come see me, but wear a mask, but come see me. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, so we I'm have in Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, forget it, Beck. Forget it. But sorry. Right. Yeah. So, um, just wanted to uh, drop in my email. If anyone's interested, you can either reach out to myself if you want um, have more questions about the space, 
Um, but also reach out to Philly at CIC.com if you're interested in that offer and we can uh, take it from there. Well, also, Beck, um, there were a lot of questions about your report. We, uh, we will do a follow-up email, which will show you how to, how to, um, um, to buy um, Paula's book because it, oh, it's, it's actually a bit, um, available now on um, Kindle. Kindle, isn't it, um, Paula? So, so you can you can pre-order both Kindle and paperback now, okay. but you won't actually um, get it until the 16th. Okay. All right. So that's available now. So, but we'll send any follow-up information um, to you. But Beck, go ahead and what's the name of that report? Nicole's got it. I can't remember. Uh, I've got the, re it's the uh, workplace resources, stress and performance in COVID-19. I'll put the link in. Um, yeah, I'd like that too. Like. <laughs> okay. So, um, Primary research. so it's great seeing everybody again. I missed you all. It was last, it was December. So, um, Hey, please stay in touch and let us know other topics or things that you would be interested in. I couldn't, when I saw Paula's network, I was like, wow, we have to have Paula because there wasn't, I, I think there wasn't any, there's nobody around that isn't suffering or dealing with this right now. And thank you so much, Paula, for all your time. And Paula, doing all this and you have a five-year-old, don't you? I do. She's, she'll be five on April 2nd. And so, <laughs> so yes, it's, it's been an interesting last year with, you know, pandemic and writing a book and a five-year-old and, yeah. so, and all that, and all that. So <laughs> thanks everybody. And